Appreciate it. I am really excited to be here today. My name is Steve Kraus. I run a study called the Ipsos Affluent Survey. And for 40 years, we've been studying the lives and lifestyles of affluent Americans. And as part of that, we've been studying the ebb and flow of wealth concentration in our society. And one of the things that we found is the level of wealth concentration has huge implications, not just for how people spend or how they invest, the level of wealth concentration is shaping the structure of our society itself. It shapes who we vote for. It's shaping our ambitions, our anxieties, and even how we think about the American dream itself. So that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, as I get started here, I, I want to propose that we do something radical, and that is we try to agree on some facts. Now, I know in this day and age of alternative facts, that sounds a little hard. If you say, oh, how about we agree on some facts? People say things like, well, let me go look up in the dictionary the definition of facts before I can agree that I might be able to agree to some facts. But I've got some facts up here about the new economy that I don't think are too controversial. So I would argue in the new economy, technology is proliferating faster than ever and ever uh, than ever before that communication has become instantaneous and global, that consumer markets are globalizing, that labor markets are in flux, that wealth is shifting into, a hand, into the hands of a few, and by and large, those people are not hated. They are rather admired. The stock market is hitting new highs, even though most people are invested in the stock market in this country. So it's not helping everybody. And finally, as I mentioned, that the American dream is changing from one of comfortable affluence to desires for uber wealth. So can we agree on this as basic facts about the new economy? Well, here's the really interesting thing. I wrote this description to describe the new economy of the 1920s. Okay. So Grant, if you'll uh, advance the slide there for a moment. If you think about the 1920s, it was a time of tremendous technological change. You had uh, telephones, radio, motion pictures. You had all of the changes of the Industrial Revolution. You had labor markets in huge flux. You had occupations suddenly going out of business, people having to move to different locations and learn new skills to thrive in a new workplace. That we had tremendous income concentration. The picture up there is of John Rockefeller. He was by far the richest man in American history. In today's dollars, his net worth would be about $340 billion. If you look at it all time in the US, you adjust for inflation, Bill Gates comes in about number five on the list. This guy was far and away number one. And although some people certainly called them robber barons for the most part, these people were looked at as, you know, with, with a mixture of, of envy and uh, a certain admiration, I think. And as those images of really wealthy people became more and more part of our culture, the American dream itself started to change. And we started to aspire not just to comfortable affluence, but for the great wealth of a Jay Gadsby, from F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic novel. The exact same thing is going on today. So before we get to today, I want to continue on with this historical narrative a little bit, talk about how wealth concentration has changed as context for thinking about what wealth concentration is doing today. So this chart shows the amount of income in share terms held by the, the top 10% of the country. So if you look back, you'll see that in the Gilded Era, this peaked in 1929, when you had 10% of the people at the top garnering about half of all of the income in the country. You see it went down a little bit with a stock market crash of 1929, but really it took the dragging on of the depression for several years for people to really take action. That action came in the form of raising taxes on the wealthy. In the 1920s, the top marginal tax rate was less than 30%. It went up and up. By 1945, the top marginal tax rate was 90%. 90% tax bracket for the wealthiest people. And it remained there from 1945 well into the 60s. And that change in taxes brought about a period of time the economists call the Great Compression. Because the incomes of those at the top and the incomes of those at the bottom started to get closer and closer together. Now certainly it wasn't just taxes on the wealthy. There were a lot of other things going on as well. There was a boom in manufacturing jobs. There was a boom in education thanks to the GI Bill. Labor unions were strong. A lot of things were going on that caused that great compression. 
And during that time, there was a lot of dislike of the wealthy because at this point, if you looked at the Forbes list of the richest people in the 50s and 60s, they all had the same last names. They were Rockefellers and DuPonts and Carnegies and Mellons, and they were looked down upon because they just inherited the money. They didn't really earn it themselves. And so the American dream really started to change, and that American dream of the 1950s was very much a mass affluent American dream. We wanted a nice house in the suburbs, a nice car, a stable job, 2.5 kids, that's all you needed. You know, I think my favorite exemplar of this period of time was a man named George Romney. He had previously been governor of Michigan. At this time, he was president of American Motors Corporation. He was making about $275,000 a year. Now that put him in the top 0.01% of the country. So it's one of the highest incomes in the country. In today's terms, that'd be about $1.8 million. Now today, a CEO of a major company who's making $1.8 million is embarrassed because all of his other CEO friends are gonna make fun of him for making so little. But not for George Romney. George Romney was embarrassed because he thought that was too much. He said he didn't think executives should make that much. It was almost bad taste back then to make so much money. Now, interestingly, this man, George Romney, had a son named Willard, who was better known by his middle name of Mitt, who came of age during a different generation of wealth concentration, and he did not stop at $1.8 million. He, he did not think it was bad taste to make more than that. We'll, we'll talk about that a, a little bit more in a little bit. So this is what happened up until the 1960s. The top tax rate stayed at 90% up until John F. Kennedy decided that he wanted to lower that. John F. Kennedy, uh, while trying to convince people this was a good idea, he actually coined the phrase in this context, a rising tide lifts all boats. John F. Kennedy was philosophically the father of trickle-down economics, even though we don't remember him that way. We remember generally the father of trickle-down economics as being Ronald Reagan. Because it wasn't really until the 1980s that income concentration started to take off and really has not stopped since then. Taxes were lowered. By the start of the 1980s, the top tax bracket was 70%. By the end of the 1980s, it had dropped to 28%. Capital gains taxes were lowered. And there were also some other more arcane tax law changes that really made it possible for the venture capital industry to become the very, very profitable industry than it is today. And so wealth became more and more concentrated. And what happened, among other things? Well, our vision of the American dream changed. So Gordon Gekko, in the movie Wall Street, said greed is good. He also said, damn, this phone is heavy. <laughs> um, and as you can see, if you again look at that line, what percent of the income is being garnered by the top 10%? It's higher than ever. It's higher now than it was in 1929. So if we go ahead to the next slide, we've got another way of looking at it. Here we're going to focus in just over the last 50 years or so. And what Ipsos has done here is taken data from the current population survey that's conducted every year by the Census Bureau. We look at household income. We track it back over 50 years. We've broken it into quintiles or fifths. We've adjusted for inflation. And what you see is that pretty much all of the income growth of the past half century has gone to the people we would generally call the affluent, roughly the top 20, 25 percent of the country. And things are even more highly concentrated than that. If you look at the top 5%, you see their growth has been even stronger. And that top 5%, after you adjust for inflation, they've got $180,000 more a year than people in the top 5% in the 1960s. That's $180,000 after inflation that just drops to the bottom line and is available for discretionary spending and for investing. So that's kind of where we are today. I want to give you a few other statistics, if we'll go ahead to the next slide, about the state of income concentration today. Well, one good thing is that most people now believe income concentration is going on. And for a long time, that was not the case. When I first started talking and writing about wealth concentration uh, back about 10 years ago, often the reaction I got from audiences was one of, sort of reminding me of what Mark Twain said about lies. He said there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And when I started talking about, well, you know, the, the rich are getting richer, people said, well, if that's your political point of view, I'm sure you could torture some data set into finding some evidence that looks like it supports that. 
Well, I, I don't hear that anymore because we look at all the most objective sources of information out there and it's very clear that the rich have been getting richer. It's happened nonstop since the early 80s. It paused briefly from 2008 to 2010 at the height of the recession. It didn't really dip, but it paused, but it's gone up and up since then. So people believe in wealth concentration, but they also massively underestimate it. We've done a number of studies where we ask people questions like, well, what percent of the net worth in the country do you think is held by the top X percent or the bottom Y percent? And people do a terrible job at this, and they're always getting the answers wrong in the same direction of underestimating how concentrated wealth is in our society. In round numbers, one-fourth of the people in this country hold three-fourths of all the net worth. Three percent of the people hold about 50 percent of the net worth. If we look at affluence, again, that's who we call roughly the top 20, 25 percent of the country. If we look at their spending, they spend on an annual basis 2.5 times more than non-affluent households. They spend two to three times more in every category you can think of. They spend five to ten times more in more high-end or luxury categories. The affluent outspend the non-affluent in 92% of the categories that the government measures, and the government measures literally hundreds. The only categories where the non-affluent outspend the affluent are categories like cigarettes, coin-operated laundries, and Medicare. So it really is a dramatic effect, whether you're looking at income, whether you're looking at net worth, whether you're looking at spending. Oxfam recently came out. Uh, they found that the top eight individuals in the world have as much net worth as the bottom half of the planet, the bottom 3.5 million people. Those top eight people, they're all men. Six of the eight are white, male, American technology executives. And maybe those eight people are working 450 million times harder than those people in the bottom half, but I, I find that a little hard to believe. You know, another really interesting stat, I don't have it up there. Uh, take a guess as to what the number one Google search term was in 2016. Anybody know? You might think that the most searched term had something to do with the election. And all those, those terms barely made the top 10. It wasn't number one. The number one term searched on Google in the US in 2016 was Powerball. <laughs> That's not a sign of a healthy, thriving economy. In fact, right up at the top of the list were what I called the three Ps, Powerball, Prince, and Pokemon Go. <laughs> Way to keep your eye on the ball, America. There's another great statistic, if you'll uh, advance uh, to, the, to the next part of the slide. Rex Tillerson, now our Secretary of State, is taking a 99% pay cut. As CEO of ExxonMobil, he made $24.3 million a year as salary. That doesn't include any stock options. The Secretary of State earns a little bit over $200,000. Think about how great a job would have to be for you to take it if you're only going to earn 1% of what you were making before. If your new boss says, oh, here's a great new job for you, we're going to have to cut the last couple of zeros off your salary. So wealth concentration, as we've seen, is a reality. And it's dramatic. And it's more dramatic than people understand. And if we'll go ahead to the next slide, what we'll see is that this is changing everything. It's changing really fundamental things in our society. Obviously, wealth concentration has a lot of implications for luxury companies and luxury brands. In fact, it's reshaping how every company is doing business. A couple of years ago, Procter & Gamble, which became the biggest advertiser in the world by creating brands for the great thriving American middle class, came out and said, you know what? We don't view the economy that way anymore. We don't see a great thriving American middle class. We see a small group at the top who can pay a premium for high-end things, and then we see a great mass of people below that. And even in terms of the kinds of behaviors that P&G would look at, people in, in the middle class who are becoming fewer in numbers, they often act like people who are really struggling in terms of their value orientation. They're focused on coupons and groupons and store brand. The, the economy has really become bifurcated. P&G looks at the economy and says, well, increasingly tied and crest 
are going to become affluent purchases. They're no, they're no longer sort of those, those hallmarks of, of consumer success that they were in the 50s and 60s. And a, a few months after P&G came out and said that, Frito-Lay came out and said, you know what, we view the economy differently now. There's, there's a small group of more elite, less price sensitive snackers, and then there's the other 80%. We're more value oriented snackers. And companies hadn't wanted to say this for a long time because it kind of sounds un American to say, well, there isn't this great thriving American middle class anymore. But in fact, there's not. And these companies really didn't get a lot of blowback from it because people are believing all of this now. You know, financial service companies who've kind of always really understood that a few people own a lot of the money, they're preparing now for the transfer of wealth. Maybe you've heard about that with the aging of the baby boom, trillions of dollars are going to be handed down to the next generation. There will be a tremendous transfer of wealth, a very, very concentrated transfer of wealth, mostly among that 3% of the people who own half of the dollars. So wealth concentration is reshaping the strategy of every business. It, I would argue, and I, I did, I wrote an article in Forbes about how wealth concentration was the most fundamental issue in the election, even though neither candidate wanted to explicitly talk about it, in part because they were both one percenters by, by a mile. But first, let's start with Bernie Sanders. Okay? Here's a guy who made it all the way end of the primary, to the end of the primary season, challenging the closest thing that we had to an incumbent, while coming out and saying, I'm a socialist. What used to be, that was the worst insult you could hurl at your political opponent. And to suggest that your opponent might support socialized medicine was like calling him a commie pinko traitor. And here we have a guy saying, I'm a socialist, going all the way to the end. And then we have Donald Trump, who I would argue, really his success was built on those people who were left behind by income concentration. And it's not just about red state, blue state, it's really about red county and blue county. And you see how it, uh, how it unfolds there on that chart. And you could overlay on that income, you could overlay on that education, you could overlay on that urban, and you really start to get a sense of how polarized this country is. When John Edwards ran for president a few cycles ago, he, his stump speech was all about the two Americas. And it, it didn't really catch on, because people weren't quite ready for the message yet. But there are definitely two Americas. I would argue maybe even three. You've got the mass population, you've got this comfortable affluence group in the top quarter, and then you've got the group, the really elite group at the top. Now, it's interesting that so many of these people left behind by income concentration voted for Donald Trump, and it's not clear at all that his policies are really going to help them. He's talked about tax cuts for everybody. Last time we had tax cuts for everybody, it translated to a few hundred dollars for people in the middle class and thousands of dollars for wealthy people. Donald Trump has talked about repealing the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. A lot of people don't realize the Affordable Care Act was funded in large part by a tax increase on those making over $250,000. So if the Affordable Care Act goes away, away goes that tax increase, and all of a sudden, that top 3% of the country that has half the dollars are going to get thousands of dollars in tax breaks. And finally, I would argue that wealth concentration that we're seeing today is fundamentally changing the American dream. You know, we had that mass affluent American dream of the 1950s, and if you'll uh, advance the slide one, you know, you might think of it as kind of a, a leave it to beaver kind of thing. We talked about that. You wanted safe, secure, your 2.5 kids. Well, what happens now? If you'll advance, well, we've got a whole generation of people <laughs> who've grown up following the lies of Kim and Kanye. And that uber wealth feels so close to this next generation. One of the things that we find is different about, about Gen Z, the kids of today, as opposed to millennials, when Gen Z interacts with a brand on social media, they expect a response. Because that world of celebrity and brand feels so close to them, it's shaping their expectations about what success is. The other day, my phone rang, and my, uh, my 10-year-old son at the time saw it, and the call was coming in from Cleveland, Ohio. My son said, Dad, you better answer it. It might be LeBron. <laughs> now, setting aside the fact that when I was a kid, a phone was a thing on a wall that had a rotary dial, and we didn't have caller ID, even beyond the obvious technological changes, when I was a kid, it never occurred to me that Magic Johnson might be calling. <laughs> I never said, Dad, you better answer the phone. It might be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 
but we're, we're seeing a generation now who have these images of success that are so lofty. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because it is a generation that is struggling financially. It's a generation, as often been said, was weaned on participation medals. What happens when it sinks in that they might not have the lives of Kim and Kanye? So if we'll advance to uh, just a couple of final thoughts. So what do we do about all this? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is do what we're kind of doing today is agreeing on some facts. So those facts are, it's been going on for 35 years, it's real, it's way more prevalent than people realize, and our 35-year experiment in trickle-down economics has really shown no evidence that it actually works. And beyond that, I think we need to go out and seek out more facts, because there are other places in the world that are really attacking this problem aggressively. There are places in the world experimenting with things like basic income, which is the notion that all people deserve a basic level of income regardless of their employment status. It's a basic human right. Some countries are creating more, more compression, that narrowing of the wealth concentration gap on a before tax basis by doing things around minimum wage laws. Others do it on an after tax basis. So I think we really have to look at facts, try to agree on facts, seek out more facts as a way of coming up with a strategy for how we're going to deal with this. I think we need to teach literacy about the new economy, and by that I mean sharing the kinds of facts that we're talking about today. Uh, with my own son, I talk about the economy, and I talk about sort of these, these three Americas. You've got the mass population, you've got the affluent. The affluent, for all intents and purposes, went to college. That's sort of the biggest predictor of sort of being in this mass affluent group. They got the same sensible job their parents told them to get. Uh, there's also a lot of evidence that, that being married or partnered sort of helps you become affluent and stay affluent. Part of it is just financial. You get more money, more discretionary money. There's also research shows that if you're married or partnered, you can better recover from a challenge like uh, losing a job or losing your health insurance while maintaining your affluent status. The wealthy are a little bit different. They have a different risk profile. And they took tremendous risk to go out and, and start a business. The things we find about the wealthy is that, by and large, they didn't set out to be wealthy. They set out to pursue a passion and took tremendous risk to make that happen. So I, I use this way of thinking about the economy both when I'm talking to CEOs and when I'm talking to my son to help him think about, well, what is the economy like now? What are the kinds of skills that you might need? What kind of skills are a good fit for you? I think we need to develop a new syntax of success. If we start to talk about putting more taxes on the wealthy, a lot of times people say, oh, you're talking about the redistribution of wealth. Okay, that's the new way of calling somebody a commie pinko trader. And here's the thing. Anytime you have taxes, you are redistributing wealth. And furthermore, we've been redistributing wealth for the past 35 years. We've just been redistributing it all to the rich people. So we, we need to talk about it differently. We need to talk about changing how we redistribute. I think one of the most concerning things about all this is social mobility is going down. The ability of people to move up the economic ladder is becoming harder and harder. Your parents' income is becoming a better predictor over time of your own income. So if we develop a new language that avoids some of the, the hot buttons that set other people off and talk about how do we build more social mobility, how do we build more equality of opportunity, I think that can get us over the hump to some changes. And the final thing I think that we need to do is ask ourselves, what do we want America to look like? Think about the American cities. As part of this wealth concentration, the middle class has gotten smaller. A lot of middle class people have moved out of the cities. Our cities are becoming really, really polarized. So what do we want American cities to look like? If you go ahead to the next slide, do we want it to look like Caracas, Venezuela? Got the really wealthy living side by side a lot of very, very poor people. If you go to my final slide, do we want American cities to look like Dubai? Just let that image sink in a little bit. Is that what we want? It said a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'll leave you contemplating that image and asking yourselves, what do we want America to look like? Thank you very much.